There was a slave on the block during the slavery days. He was young, looked healthy and strong. And the bidding began. And the auctioneer started. And the bidding continued. And the young slave began to yell and say, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your time because I ain't working for anybody. The bidding continued to go higher and higher. And he yelled even the more. And finally, the auctioneer said, sold to the highest bidder. Well, the man who paid the price went and got the slave on the wagon and all the way to the man's home the slave kept on renting the air by his cursing and swearing and telling the one who paid the price you wasted your money didn't you hear what I've said to you I ain't working for you I ain't working for anybody the man just kept on driving his wagon until they got to the house. And he jumped off the wagon, got the key and took off the shackles. And the fellow said, didn't you hear me? I ain't working for you. And the man said, I did not pay the price for you to be a slave. I paid the price to set you free. You're free. That shocked the slave. He said, what you say? He said, I paid the price to set you free. You're free to go. And the man started walking away. That young man was so overwhelmed and overtaken by the kindness of that gentleman that he ran and turned him around and said, Mister, I'll serve you forever. And so at one point in earth's history, someone paid the price for you. And thank God he paid the price for you so you could be free. What do you say? Amen. And our response should be, I'll serve you forever. Let's pray together. As we study the word, Holy Father, we're grateful for your kindness to us. That through your blessed Son, you've delivered us from the bondage of sin, the yoke that was heavy upon us. And now tonight, as we study in freedom, we ask that your Spirit will somehow trigger in us a greater sense of all that you have done and a greater sense of appreciation. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, I'd like you to turn to, in your Bible, to the first verse. I think many of you have uh, heard this verse before. And sometimes you've heard it by people misusing it as well as using it correctly. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus is wrapping up what is some people call the Beatitudes. And I don't know if you knew what that actually meant. It's the attitude you should be. Be attitudes. Did you get it? And so Jesus then wanted us to have the attitude that he exposes there in Holy Writ in Matthew chapter 5. The spirit that you should have should be the spirit that Christ had. And so, in chapter 5 then, and uh, verse 17, he actually says, 
don't think that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. And the reason he said that is because he was repeating several times, if you have been heard that it's said in the old times, thou shalt not do this. But I say, and you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say, and you heard thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say. So since he was saying, I say, I say, I say, it, it, there's no question that those who are seeking fault with him might have taken opportunity of those words to say, you see, he's making up his own laws. So to make sure that there was no question about that, Jesus then said, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. For verily I say unto you, verse 18, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle and no wise shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now it's interesting that some people think that the word fulfilled means to complete, to do away with. But the word uh, fulfilled does not mean to do away with. It means the opposite. Let me give you a, an example. In chapter 3, when Jesus was going to be baptized, he went to John the Baptist to get baptized. And as he approached John the Baptist, uh, John forbade him. Verse 14, do you see that? Matthew chapter 3 and verse 14. Notice it says, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. There's the same little word, fulfill. Do you see that? So if the word fulfill means to do away with, then we also do away with what? With righteousness. But Jesus did not come to do away with righteousness. He came to establish righteousness. What do you say? So the word fulfill means to be in harmony with. To be what? To be in harmony. In other words, full fill, to fill it full. Now, in chapter 5, Jesus said, Not one jot nor one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And I think some of you have heard people use the, the illustration that the jot and the tittle. The tittle is the crossing of a T and the jot is the dotting of an I. How many of you have heard that explanation before? Any of you? You mean uh, few of you have heard that explanation? What happened to the rest of you? Where you all been, as they say down south yonder? It is the definition that a lot of people give to that verse. Jot or tittle. Dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. However, Jesus was not speaking in English. So since he was not speaking in English, it could not be a jot or tittle. Do you understand? Because uh, the language he was speaking in did not have a T, nor did it have an I. So, let's look at what was really being said by our master concerning the law. Notice he is saying, not one jot, no one tittle shall pass from what? From the law. From what? From the law. So Jesus is referring to the law, and in order to understand what he's speaking about, you have to go to where the law is. Does that make sense? Because he said, not one jot or one tittle shall be taken out of the law. So to understand that, then we have to go to where Jesus was actually quoting from or referring this from. Now, let's look at the Hebrew Bible then to get the answer. I think all of you know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Is that true? Or am I making an assumption? 
How many of you know that it was written in Hebrew? Can I see your hands? All right, the majority of you voted yes. How many of you did not know? How many of you don't want to raise your hand? <laughs> I saw you. Sometimes people want to make sure that they get it right so they don't raise their hands so that when they hear the right answer, then, then they say, uh-huh, that's what I thought. Okay. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus is saying something extremely important. And even though he uses minuteness, it is only for emphasis. It is for what? Emphasis. In other words, he, not the smallest part of the law can be removed. Not the smallest what? Part of the law. So in order for us to get the answer, we go to the Hebrew Bible and uh, we want to be able to get some information about the Hebrew Bible. First of all, the first scribe, and I didn't use the word author, because the author of the first five books of the Bible is God. Who is it? God. But the first amanuensis, scribe, or what you would call secretary, taking notes, was Moses. But it's interesting that Moses was brought up in Egypt, in the courts of the pharaohs. He was actually next in line to be the pharaoh. So he had to be able to understand the language of the Egyptians. And their writings was called hieroglyphics. What was it called? Hieroglyphics. So since Moses spent 40 years in Egypt and then 40 years out in the wilderness someplace, why is it that God decided to lead Moses to write it in Hebrew rather than the language that he was educated in, in hieroglyphics? God has wisdom. And sometimes the wisdom of God seems foolishness to man. But there's a reason for what he does. Here is an example of hieroglyphics. How many of you can see the lettering up there? Can you see that? All of that that you see up there looks like a crow and looks like a bird and looks like a, there, there are all sorts of strange looking symbols. All of that is hieroglyphics. So how many of you can read that? Anybody here? You're looking at me and saying, well, Pastor Troy, you ought to know better. But I'm only asking because I want to help us to focus on the importance of why Jesus was making the statement about the law. Listen, I, w I was in England and I went to the museum in England because I heard about something called the Rosetta Stone. Now, how many of you have heard of the word Rosetta in terms of translation? Uh, in other words, learning languages. How many of you heard of Rosetta? Okay. That actual word is being utilized because the Rosetta stone was found and it was uh, actually uh, made in 196 years before Christ. When? So 196 years before Christ, the Rosetta stone was made. But it was not discovered till 1790. Nine. So how many years is that? Well, at least 1,799 years plus 196 leads you to understand that it's over uh, 1,900 years. So for 1,900 years, the Rosetta Stone was buried. Was what? Was buried. Now, why was it important to discover that stone? Well... Let me show you a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. And it's, it's in the museum there in England. And if you happen to go to England, any of you have been to the museum in England? Any of you? One of you. And two of you. All right. And you probably saw the Rosetta Stone, correct? Yes? All right. And the reason why it's important is because it was written in three languages. How many? Three, three languages. And... It was because of these, this Rosetta Stone 
that finally hieroglyphics was deciphered because one of the languages that was written was in hieroglyphics. It, it was actually a business stone. So people who wanted to deal with Egypt and all that, they needed to understand the language. So it was written in three languages so people could decipher what they were reading in hieroglyphics. But, as I said, it was buried for about 1,900 years. So think of it. If God had chosen to have the Bible written in hieroglyphics, how many of us would have had the opportunity to know about the Bible? What would have happened to the writings of God? They would have been buried. Would have been what? Buried. So in God's wisdom, he chose to have Moses write the Bible in and a language called Hebrew, which was, by the way, the first Hebrew mentioned in the Bible is Abraham. Did you know that? Yeah. So God had the Bible written in Hebrew, which has 22 letters in the alphabet. How many? 22 letters in the alphabet. Which means then that all of you, how many of you? All of you can learn Hebrew. Isn't that wonderful? Well, is it? Yes or no? Yes. All of us can learn Hebrew. And you should know this, that the Hebrew spoken by Jews today is approximately the same Hebrew that was spoken back many years ago. Unlike Greek. Greek, when we study Greek in the, the, the uh, school, the Greek that we study that was written was classical Greek. And most Greeks do not speak the Greek of the Bible. But it's interesting that nonetheless, Greek was easy to translate and Hebrew was easy to translate. And that's why anybody in the world can have a copy of the Bible in their language. Because God chose an easy language or two easy languages to translate from. Good news, what do you say? So, if you speak Spanish, you can get it in Spanish. If you speak Romanian, you can get it in Romanian. If you speak Portuguese uh, you, or Portuñón, one of the mixtures, you can get it in that language. So, when I was in, uh, serving in Guam, Micronesia, uh, I've served as a president of that territory. We had over a thousand islands. And throughout that area, there were many, many, many different groups of people. They call them Micronesians, but each main island had a different language and a different culture. So if I went to Yap, they spoke Yapese. If you went to Chuk, they spoke Chukis. If you went to Palawan, they spoke Palawan. So all of the, these were different languages there. And the wonderful thing is that the Bible has been translated into those different languages. So even a little small group of people way out in the Pacific can have the Bible in their own language. Good news, what do you say? Which means then that salvation is available to how many? All. All. I thank God for his mercy and for his, the wonderful way that he has led. Now listen, it was not until 1822 that the Rosetta Stone opened up the meaning of hieroglyphics. So even though they found it in the 1700s, it was not until 1822 that the Bible, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, hieroglyphics were finally deciphered. That means then that if the Bible had been written in that language, the understanding would have been locked up until 1822. Now, let's go to the meaning then of the jot and tittle. We must be able to find it in the Hebrew language. So we, I'm going to take you to Psalms 119. So if you have your Bibles then, look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119 is the longest Psalms, as the pastor made mention, in the Bible. In fact, it's the, long, the, what, it's the chapter that is the longest in the entire Bible. All right? 119 and actually has 176 verses. 176 verses. One thing that a lot of people don't know, and, and I feel really sorry for churches 
who somehow have locked up the Old Testament as something only for the Jews. See what I said? I feel sorry for churches, pastors who will tell their members the Old Testament was for the Jews, it's not for us today. I feel bad about that because they are actually cheating their members out of glorious, glorious revelations that God gave, not to the Jews, but to all of us in the Old Testament. And let me say this, if you do not have the Old Testament to help you to understand the New Testament, you're going to come to wrong conclusions in the New Testament. The Old Testament is the foundation. It is the what? It is foundation. And I should tell you this, that the majority of the New Testament is actually referencing the Old Testament. So let's look at Psalms 119. Now, you may ask, why am I going there? Because Jesus was speaking about the law. And Psalms 119 is all entirely about the law. And what's interesting about chapter 119 is that it is divided into 22 sections or 22 alphabet. In other words, the, the, the Lord inspired the writer of 119, Psalms 119, to divide up the 22 alphabets into the sections here. And each section was to have eight verses. How many? Eight verses. So if you have a Bible like mine, my Bible is a Cambridge Bible. It's a King James Version, but it's a Cambridge Bible. And it actually had the Hebrew letters, the alphabet. How many of you have a Bible with the Hebrew alphabet in it? Any of you? Several of you have it, okay? If you look at your, your, the Hebrew alphabet, it begins with Aleph, which is like the letter A. Then the Beth, Gimel, Dalek. These are the, the Hebrew letters of the alphabet. Now, what's interesting is that it divides it into eight sections. So there's, pardon me, eight sections or eight verses in one section and 22 altogether. So if you multiply uh, 22 by eight, you come to the, the number, okay? Now, what's interesting is this, that this particular chapter, since it's all about the law, uses different words or synonyms for the law. Let me give you a, a uh, demonstration here. Notice that it begins with, Blessed are the undefiled in the what? In the way who walk in the what? In the law of the Lord. So if you walk in the law of the Lord, you are blessed. You're what? You are blessed. Okay. But notice next one, it says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. His what? Testimonies. So the testimonies is another word for the law. Here, look at verse 3. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. So ways is another word for the law. Then the next one is precepts. Notice it says, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Then verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Do you see that? So we find then law, testimonies, ways, precepts, statutes. Verse 6 says, commandments, thy commandments. Verse 7 says, thy righteous judgments. And verse 8 says, I will keep thy statutes. And then if you read from verse 9 to verse 16, it goes through the same words, but again, using different uh, ideas. For example, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So the word is another word for law. Notice then it says, with my whole heart have I sought thee, and let me not wander away from thy commandments. Then it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And you have to remember that what God said later on in the last days, he will write his what? His law where? In their hearts. You see? So, thy word have I hid where? In my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
Then it says, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all thy judgments. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. I meditate in thy precepts. I will delight myself in thy statutes. Do you see that? And the whole chapter is like that. Different synonyms to amplify the full significance of the law of God. I'm not hearing any amen. Maybe you're so overwhelmed by what you just heard. They said, wow, I didn't know that. But listen, the Psalms is entirely about the law. It utilizes synonyms to express the full extent of the commandments of God. So if Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law, you must know then that the law must have been extremely important to our Savior. What do you say? Amen. Now, let's look at it a little bit. As I said, there's 176 verses, and it's divided into 22 sections. The first uh, eight verses, you can see the different words that refer to the law. And uh, then each verse begins with the Hebrew letter under the, its designation. Uh, it, you know, I, I write poetry now and then. And th this chapter just overwhelms me because the writer had to write all the first verses beginning with letter A. All the second uh, section, all the second group with letter B. The third with letter C. The fourth is letter D. You understand what I'm saying? So every, every verse had to begin with the letter designated under that particular section. You understand how difficult that would be? Yes or no? Now listen. Let's look at the actual Hebrew. Here's the actual Hebrew. Now if you notice then, in Hebrew then, I don't know if you can see that. First one begins with Aleph. Can you see that? Verse 2 begins with the same letter. Verse 3 begins with the same letter. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8. They all begin with the same Hebrew letter. Then Beth. The next section begins with the letter Beth, 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 Beth. And so on, all the way through the course until you get to the end of Psalms 170, uh, 119 with 172 verses. Wow, what do you say? Amazing. But listen, we are trying to discover the jot and the what? And the tittle. So when I said that you have to find it in Hebrew. So here's the jot. Here's the what? Here is the jot. And if you have your Bible there, and you want to find out what a jot looks like, look at verse 73. Right above verse 73 is the jot. And it turns out that the jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The what? It is the what? The smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the jot. It almost looks like an apostrophe. Can you see that? How many of you are seeing it? All right. You can see it up there. Can you see it up there? That's the jot. So when Jesus says not one jot, he's speaking about the Hebrew letter jot. Not a jot of the eye. <laughs> so what he's saying is not the smallest letter shall be removed from the law. The jot. But there's more to it. The tittle is only a stretching of one of the alphabets to make it look different from the other. In other words, there are two letters that look almost the same, especially when you handwrite them, okay? So the, the Beth has a little tittle, which means a little piece of this line sticking out. And the cough doesn't have the little the uh, line sticking beyond the letter. 
So the tittle is just a little point sticking out of the letter B. <laughs> Not one jot, no one tittle. Shall be removed from the law till all be fulfilled. But there's something even more interesting. In the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, how many of you know where the Ten Commandments are found? How many of you know that? How many of you do not know where the Ten Commandments are found? Again, I see no hands going up. So I'll tell you. I'll be a professor with mercy. I'll tell you where it is. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus what? Chapter 20 is one that is mostly referred to. There are two places in Deuteronomy also. But Exodus chapter 20 primarily is the one that most people refer to. Now, if you look at the first commandment, it says, basically, I am the Lord your God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt of the house of bondage. Okay? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The interesting thing about that is this, that when it says, I am Jehovah God, you have Jehovah is actually these four letters. You see these four letters here? You see what I'm talking about? Yes? Okay. The Hebrew felt God's name too sacred to write out. So they only wrote four consonants. How many? Four consonants. And that four consonants begins with the letter Jot. Begins with what? With the letter Jot. So when Jesus says, not one jot can be removed from the law, he knew what he was talking about. Because if you remove the jot, who do you remove from the law? Jehovah. And that's precisely what the enemy has sought to do with God's commandments. He has let many, many, many Christians believe that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross and therefore we don't have to worry about them anymore. The reality is that Jesus would not go to the extent of emphasizing that not the smallest letter could be removed so that then people can say it's gone. No, on the contrary. Jesus emphasized that to let you know that it is impossible because if you remove the jot, you have removed who? Jehovah. And so God is not pleased with that. And that's why he begins the Ten Commandments with, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You see, if you remove Jehovah from the law, anybody can claim to be God. And presently today, there are many, many human beings, I'm not saying one, there are many human beings right now as we're speaking that are claiming to be Christ. Did you know that? There are two in the, there is a two in Japan right now. How many? There are two in Japan. There's one in the Philippines. There's one in India. I've known about these because I've become acquainted with those situations. But I could show you a slide, I have no time for it tonight, of all the different individuals who are claiming to be Christ. There was one down there in, in Miami, Florida, who was claiming to be Jesus. Did you know that? He was of Puerto Rican birth. He claimed to be Jesus. So there are many people who claim to be Jesus. So if you remove Jehovah out of the law, then anybody can say, you need to obey me. You need to make sure you don't have anybody before me. But the Bible makes sure that there's only one to worship, and that is the one that made heaven, the earth, and all that is in them. And there's no human being that has created the heavens and the earth. So, not one jot nor one tittle. Don't remove the jot because if you do, you've removed 
God from the law. And God is the one who gave us the law. So to remove Jot is to remove Jehovah out of the law. So let me ask you a question then. Who wrote the Ten Commandments? Who did? Well, you say God, but who in particular? Was it the Father or was it the Son? How many of you say the Father? Can I see your hands? How many of you say the Son? Can I see your hands? How many of you don't know? Can I see your hands? All right. <laughs> the reality is that the Son is the one who wrote the law. Now, you may say, how do you know that? Well, number one, he makes several claims. When he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, where was that from? Do you know? Do you know where that Jesus was quoting from? Oh, you may say, well, I didn't even know Jesus was quoting. He was quoting. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's John 14, 15, correct? If you love me, keep my commandments. Where is that from? Well, it comes from the second commandment. Which commandment? The second commandment, which finally says, show mercy unto thousands of them who, who what? Who love me and keep my commandments. You see? Jesus is claiming to be the one who gave the commandment, love me and keep my commandments. But there's more information in the scriptures, and because of time, I'm going to try to cover it as fast as I can. Is that okay? Uh, God told Moses, go and tell the people, I am that I am, have sent you. And of course, when Jesus was walking on the earth, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He is claiming to be the I am. But there's more. As I said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here it is in the last part of that commandment. Thou, thou shalt not bow thyself to them nor serve them. And then finally he says, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It was the Savior who wrote the commandments on the tables of stone. Now, how do I know that? Look at Exodus. Do you mind if I speed up? And if you can't keep up with me, take a deep breath. <laughs> right. So, when 40 days were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai a what? Angel. An angel. An angel appeared to uh, Moses. Now, who was that angel? Uh, that angel happened to be the one who led Israel out of Egypt. How do I know that? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Notice it says, Moreover, brethren, I was not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was who? It was Christ. So it was Christ that was actually attending the host of the Israelites from Egypt all the way to the Holy Land. Now, in Acts chapter 7, uh, we find then Stephen, before he's stoned, he is explaining the history to the Jews. And one of the things that he is saying is that Moses, an angel appeared to him. If you look at, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 7, notice that an angel appears to Moses. And as he is repeating the history, uh, notice it says, when 40 years were expired, verse 30 there, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in, uh, in a bush. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy father. It's interesting that in Exodus chapter 3, where the angel appears to Moses, it says an angel was in the, in the fire bush. Then it says the Lord looked out and saw Moses. And then it says God spoke to him. In other words, there are three titles there for the Lord. The angel of God, 
the Lord and God. In Acts chapter 7, it makes it plain then that that is one person. Notice then, as we continue to read, verse 35. Are you there? Acts chapter 7, verse 35. There's Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same that God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer. By the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So, there was an angel that appeared to him in the bush, right? Can you see that? Then it says that this angel, continue to read, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. And verse 38 says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. Did you see that? Who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai? The angel. Well, what angel is that? Well, you may say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Are you trying to tell us that Jesus was an angel? No, that's not what I'm saying to you. Jesus has over 40 different titles. How many? 40 different titles. I mean, you say, why so many titles? Because in the Bible, uh, when a name was given, it was, it, was, it was to identify the character of that particular person. But with Jesus, one title was not sufficient. So, you find then many titles. He's called the Lamb. Is that true? Yes or no? Called the Bread of Life. He's called the Light of the World. He is the, what? He is the Vine. Correct? He is a bright and morning star. There are many, many titles in the Bible. There are more than 40 titles for Jesus. And of course, another title is the angel, which simply means the messenger. What does it mean? Messenger. The messenger. For you see, let me explain this to you. Without Jesus, you and I would not be able to have any communication from heaven. Our blessed Savior became the medium of communication between heaven and earth. And the reason why you and I are benefited by heaven is because of Jesus. Without Jesus, there'd be no communication. We would be totally lost. Thank God that you have a medium or a one who stands between man and God as the link linking us to the courts of heaven. What do you say? Thank God that we have such a Savior. Listen, in Nehemiah, notice what it says. It now, this divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou ledest them in the day by a pillar, uh, uh, pardon me, cloudy pillar, and the night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the ways wherein they should go. Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai and spake with them from heaven and gave them their right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and made them known unto them the holy Sabbath, the commandments, thy precepts, thy statutes, thy laws, by the hand of Moses thy servant. Now the reason why I'm reading this is because it says here that it was one who let them out and gave them all the things that they received. Then in the book of Judges, notice what it says. And the angel of the Lord came to Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt. Who's speaking here? The angel of the Lord. Can you see that? Are you following me? Are you with me? Okay. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Does that sound like an angel? Who does it sound like? Jehovah. So Jesus was the one who led Israel out of Egypt, who protected them by day and by night, who wrote the commandments with his own finger, and that's why in the New Testament he always refers to himself as the one who led the people out of Egypt. He refers to himself as the one who gave the commandments. No wonder then he said, not one jot, but one tittle, because if you remove the jot, you remove Jesus. And if Christians understood that, they would be shocked 
to discover that when they're told that the law is done away with, then you have done away with Jesus and you can't do away with Jesus. What do you say? No. He is our Savior. He gave us the law. Jesus is the center of the law. Your Savior is the one that is in the center of the commandments. No wonder he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Listen, many years ago, there was a school in West Virginia. It was a, a one-room school. How many of you remember the one-room schools? Any of you attended those? My wife had a, we had a starter school in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, we converted our garage into a schoolroom. And fortunately, she was the teacher, so she taught eight grades in one room. It was fun and interesting. <laughs> well, in this particular school, they had a very difficult time keeping teachers because the students were kind of unruly. And since they were different ages, from 18 down, uh, they always gave the teachers a hard time. So finally, the last one left, and they could not allure any other individual to be willing to get into that school with those rascals and teach them. So somebody got the bright idea to put an announcement up in New York City. Since the New Yorkers didn't know anything about West Virginia, somebody might be liable to take it. And that's what happened. They announced it in the newspaper. There was a young teacher reading, and that man, when he saw the ad, decided he would like to take the challenge. And so he moved to West Virginia. And when he got there to that school, uh, the first day he rang the bell and all the kids came. And as soon as he turned around to write something on the board, he got bombarded with all sorts of stuff. When he turned around, everybody was holding their hands like angels. Well, he knew he was uh, going to have a tough time with them. So he didn't spend a lot of time with the kids that day. He said, okay, guys, uh, I just wanted to get acquainted with you, etc." And tomorrow we we're actually going to start class. Well, the kids were happy because they could get out of school. But the teacher was not very, very happy with what he uh, experienced. So he was thinking about it that night. And uh, as he was thinking about it, he came up with an idea. So the next day when he went, he said to the students, hey, look, I come down here from New York City. I know you think I'm a city slicker and all that, but that's OK but I want to be able to help you guys. And uh, I can't help you unless we, get, we, we put something together to get some order in the school. So that way I can teach you. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I suggest that we make up some rules. And I want you guys to help me make up the rules. So they began to shout some, uh, some rules up and down. And, and uh, it wasn't long before that he stopped at 10. He said, okay, we got enough. But now, what do we do if somebody breaks the rules? Well, Big Tom said, well, hang him from the nearest tree. Well, that's not what he was looking for. And so they said, no, no. He said, we've got to do something a little bit more milder than that. So uh, they began to talk, and finally they came up with the punishment. If somebody breaks the rules, then they'll have to come up to the front of the class, and without their coat on, We'll give them 10 strikes on the back with a rod. Well, they all liked it. They, they agreed to it. And one of the rules that they specifically mentioned was no lunch stealing. Apparently, it must have been a real problem for them. And so they agreed. And the next day then, things went very well. In fact, things went very well for several months. Everybody was happy. Things were being done in orderly fashion until one day the oldest kid, Tom, is upset. He gets up and says, it's time for lunch. And he goes looking for his lunch. He can't find it. And he said, teacher, somebody stole my lunch. If I get a hold of him. Now, wait a minute, Tom. Remember, we got rules. 
and somebody broke the rule, we also got a process. Remember that? We need to find out who it is. Well, you better find out who it is before I get to him. Anyway, they began to find who it was, and finally they located him. He was little Tim. And so the teacher said, well, Tim, did you do it? Yes, sir. You know what the punishment is? Yes, sir. All right, we'll take you up to the front of the class. So they got up to the front of the class, and there was no question that he was guilty. So the teacher said, okay, Tim, take off your coat. Uh, I can't. And the teacher said, what do you mean you can't? I, you need to take off the coat? And he said, I, I, I can't, sir. He said, Tim, take off your coat. Well, the little boy took off his coat, and he had, didn't have any shirt on, no T-shirt, just bare bone. The teacher realized that this kid was skinny. And he said, what happened to your shirt? Well, teacher, my dad died, and mama doesn't have much, and it's the only shirt I had, and she washed it today. I couldn't wear it. And then he realized the problem. Kid was hungry. And out of hunger, he stole the lunch. But now he had a problem. He had that little boy, skin and bones, standing before him. And he had that stick that he was supposed to beat the kid with 10 times. And he knew that if he used that stick to hit that little boy, that that boy may not be able to handle it. And the teacher was in a dilemma. If there was ever a time when he wished that there was no rules, it was then. Because then there was punishment for the violation of the rules. But he thought, if I don't go through with it, then we'll go back to the same mess we had before. And so he said, Tim, go ahead and turn around. And he lifted up the, the stick to hit the little boy. And Tom stood up and said, wait a minute, teacher. Wait a minute. Don't hit him. And the teacher said, what's the matter? He said, I, I can't take it, teacher. I can't take it. If little Tim takes, gets beaten by that stick, he ain't going to make it. He said, but look, teacher, I'm strong enough. I can handle it. You hit me. But Tom, you didn't do anything. You stole your lunch. I know, teacher. But he can't take it. I can. Let me take his place. Well, the teacher looked at the students. And by this time, there were a lot of wet eyes. And the teacher said, what do you think, students? And they gave him the signal to go ahead. So Tom then went up and put his body over Tim's body and said, go ahead, teacher. And so the teacher began whacking him with that stick. And when he was finished, he threw the stick down. And Tom just stood up straight, turned around and began to walk away. And as Tom was walking away, little Tim said, Hey, Tom, wait a minute. And Tom turned around. The little Tim ran and jumped up and grabbed him by the neck. And he said, Tom, I'll love you forever. Thank you for taking my punishment. Now, friends, the Lord did not die so we could do away with his standards. He died to make you free. He has written the laws with, in stone, which means that they're not changeable. And thank God that we have those laws today. What do you say? Amen. What a mess this town would be if there were no laws. But think of it. If every citizen in this town kept the Ten Commandments, what kind of town would you have? What kind of town would you have? Why, there'd be no stealing. There would be no divorce, no adultery. People would be happy. There'd be no lying, no cheating, no killing. 
What a marvelous town this would be. What do you say? God has given us those commandments for our benefit, for our blessing. And Jesus was willing to come down because you and I can't handle it. If you and I take the punishment for it, we would not make it. But Jesus could. What do you say? And not only he could, but he did. Hallelujah. What do you say? I thank God that we have that kind of Savior. I can love that kind of a Savior. What about you? He died for me. He paid the price to make me free. He died for you. He paid the price to make you free. And at last when he comes, we shall be free forever. What do you say? How many of you are grateful that God has given us those commandments? Any of you? I'm grateful. But more than that, how many of you are willing to say by God's grace, write those in my heart. Write them in my heart, Lord, so that I not only believe in them, but I'll follow them by your grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there's so much in your precious word that reveals to us the magnificence of your character, your love, your enduring love for us. We're grateful that we have a Savior who not only created us, but led Israel out of Egypt, gave us the commandments, gave us the holy writings. And we're thankful that he came to live on this earth and die for us so that we would have eternal life with those laws written on the hearts of each one of us. So bless us and keep us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.